is okay. So let us start the, the second half of our second day um, of our Amount analysis, structural geometry and application, and application session. So the, the first speaker of this second pound of talks today is Victoria Paternostro from University of Buenos Aires. And she talked to us about frames generated by the action of a discrete group. It's on you. Uh, thank you. And thank you well to all the organizers for inviting me. And well, I am going to to talk about um, some uh, about some results that we have um, with Davide, with Davide Barbieri, and with Eugenio Hernandez, from uh, both from Univers Universidad Autónoma de, de Madrid. So <clears throat> let me start by describing the objects that we will work with, and they are um, invariant subspaces. And for, for, for get an invariant subspace, we will start with a discrete and countable group, uh, which is typically non-abelian. And in fact, this is the point, the non-abelian case in this talk. And we will have also a separable Hilbert space, H, and then a unitary representation of the group gamma on the Hilbert space H, where a unitary representation is uh, an assignment of, uh, from, from gamma to the unitary operat operators on H that to each gamma gives, of course, an, a unitary operator and uh, that respects the, the group operation, meaning that the product of two elements in gamma goes to the composition of the respective uh, operators. And the identity that I will denote by E in the group goes to the identity operator, operator uh, on H. So once we have a unitary uh, representation, we can define uh, an invariant space invariant under this representation and an invariant space will be a closed subspace of H such that if I apply to each gamma the, the operator given by the representation to the whole V, then you are still in V for every gamma, okay? And if, uh, I mean, of course that these spaces always exists and, and once you have a, a, P, a, a representation and, and for, for seeing that, the, the easy, uh, easiest way to, to construct one of these spaces is to consider a family of functions, finite, finite or countable of, uh, elements in, in H. And then what you do is to consider the orbits of each of these function, and by orbit, I mean this exactly. No, I move all along the group with the representation, the, the each function of my family, and then I consider the span of these uh, elements on H, and then I just consider the closure on N, on H, and then this is an invariant space under uh, my representation pi. So let us see some examples. The first one, and, and it, it's the, the, the representation given by, by the translations where the group are the integers and the Hilbert space is L2 of RD. And the representation uh, is the usual translations that we know uh, from, from the theory of shift invariant spaces because shift invariant spaces are the name that we um, give uh, for the particular case of this representation. And we can also have modulations where we take the same group and the same Hilbert space, but instead, instead of translating our function, we will 
multiplied by an exponential with frequency k. And another example could be, for instance, the dilations, where I consider the group gamma to be the integers and the Hilbert space to be a two of R. And my unitary operators are given by the multiplication of two to the power of K. And this is a normalization factor that we need to put there to, be this, uh, to, to make these operators unitary. And we also have a shear, um, the, 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 the representation given by the shear, which um, is defined like this. Okay, so we have the Hilbert perspective L2 of R2. The group is again the integer, and this is what we do with this representation. And if we combine the two first, um, representations, the translations and the modulations. Uh, we have Gabor systems. We are given by the invariance of this representation where we translate, uh, uh, translate along the integers and modulate also along the integers. And finally, this um, Benedetto squared translations, it's squares because these kind of translations um, were introduced by both Benedetto's, Benedetto's, Benedetto father and son in a very nice paper. Uh, I think that it's from 2004. And in this case, they consider a group, which is in fact a quotient of a group G and a subgroup compact and open. I forgot to put open here, but must be compact and open. And I mean, they say that these are translations because the, the, the representation is given by the, I mean, through the Fourier transform is given by the multiplication of a multiplier <laughs> that is uh, defined in terms of the character um, related to the, to the class of X. So since the Fourier transform um, put, uh, I mean, transform a translation into a multiplication, they call this representation uh, a translation of, the, of classes of this group. Okay, so what do we want to do with these kind of spaces? Uh, we have a question that uh, is the following. We want to decide if for a given invariant space, there exists a frame of B of this form. Yes, so I, I want to know if for a given space, I can find a family of functions such that its orbits form a frame for the space, okay? And Recall, this is not the first time that we see this word in, in this session, but a frame is a sequence in a Hilbert space for which there exists A and B constant such that this inequality holds and holds for every F in, for us, uh, in the space that the family spent on H. And when A is equal to B and is equal to one, we will call this frame a parseval frame, okay? So there are some previous results regarding this um, question that we have. And the first one is when we have, again, translations, you know, we have the group is the integers, the Hilbert space is L2 of Rd, and the representations is given by the integral translations. And for this case, Bonick in 2000 uh, proved the following. First, he proved that if you have a, a function in a two and consider the shift invariant space, in this case shift, because we are with translations, generated by it. So we call these kind of spaces principal spaces because they have, they have only one generator in, in the sense of that I consider the generator and all their translations. 
its translate, translations. Then he proved that there is always another function in the space such that its orbits generates a frame, a parseval frame of the space. Okay, so if your shift invariant space is principal, Bonick showed that you can always find a, a frame generator, let's say, a, a, a generator that gives whose orbits form a frame of the space. And second, he also proved that any shift invariant space can be decomposed into an orthogonal sum of principal shift invariant spaces. So if one combine these uh, two results no, and, and take in any of these principal shift invariant spaces, a frame generator, then one can see that uh, B has a Percival frame of orbits by collecting these all gen frame generators. Okay, so another result in, the, in this direction um, was when, when the, the representation is induced by an action. Uh, an action, I mean, you have a group acting on a measured space, and then you consider a representation built from that action. I am not going to, to give any details, but just say that as an example of this situation, we have, again, translations, dilations, and, and the, 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 the shears that I presented uh, before. And we proved with Davide and, and, and Eugenio that in that case, we do have uh, frames of orbits. And we used for that a similar strategy than the than Bonix, uh, strategy. And then uh, for the case of non-discrete translations, the result was also proved by Bonick and by uh, Ross in 2015. So now uh, going back to, again, to our setting, what we can prove is the, the composition. So if, if we have a, a, a P invariant space, then we can prove that there exists a countable family such that B decomposes into an orthogonal sum of this form where, where these um, spaces are uh, the, the principal spaces generated, generated by Vj in each case. And this is the notation that we will use. So um, this result is not uh, too complicated to obtain. Uh, so to, to answer the first question that we, that we had, we need to see that for any principal P invariant space, we can find a frame generator for it. Because then we can combine the orthogonal decomposition with this and to get that we always have frame of orbits. And to this end, I would like to um, tell you a little bit about um, how this is obtained in the set of integer uh, translations. And for this, uh, we need a result, or, or there is needed a result that dates back to 1993, and it's due to Benedetto and Lee. And it says that a function phi in L2 generates a frame of translations, of integral translations, if and only if there exist A and B constants such that this sum here is bounded above from B and below from A where it is not zero. And well, this uh, sum here is a kind of periodization of the Fourier transform of phi. And with this result, uh, if you have a, um, 
uh, principal shift in variant space generated by, by phi or psi, let's say. If we take phi to be uh, defined through its Fourier transform as the Fourier transform of the generator times this periodization of it to the power of minus um, one half, then we have that this phi generates a frame for of translations for B. So I want to focus now a little bit in this object here and to say how to um, define it in the non-abelian setting. So one point to see here is that uh, we have a Fourier transform and typically our elements will be in a general in a general general Hilbert space. So, well, we uh, need to know how to do Fourier analysis. And for that, there is a way to do it. And it's in terms of uh, von Neumann algebras. So let me say what they are. So for defining a von Neumann algebra, I need to say, um, I mean, I need to fix a, a particular representation of my group gamma, and it is the right regular representation, which is defined in the standard basis of L2. Here, my Hilbert space is L2 of gamma, and I, I, I take the standard basis of L2 of gamma, which is, uh, I mean, delta gamma will have one, one in the gamma place in, and zeros otherwise. And this is, uh, what the right regular representations um, does. And here is another way to understand it. Uh, the, the right regular representation uh, act, acts on this form, okay? So once we have this, we can define the right uh, von Neumann algebra of gamma, of the group gamma, by considering the span of all these unitary operators and taking the closure in the weak operator topology to get a subspace of the bounded operators of L2 of gamma. And it can be seen that this is a C star algebra of bounded convolution operators on a little L2 of gamma. And the third ingredient that we need to do Fourier analysis here is, is a trace. And a trace is a function, is the function defined on the von Neumann algebra through this formula. So it's the, for, a, for an operator f in the von Neumann algebra, I consider the inner product in a two of gamma of the operator f applied to delta e uh, between this, this element and delta e. And delta e, of course, is the, the element that has one in the neutral uh, element of the group and zero Otherwise, it's that sequence in a two of them. Okay, so in the non-commutative um, setting, we have non-commutative LP, LP spaces that are defined in the following way. We have an F in the von Neumann algebra and its absolute value is defined by taking the Multiply the composition of the adjoint, adjoint of f with f and taking the square root. And for p um, bigger than one, we can define a p norm of this uh, element by taking the trace of the absolute value of f to the power of p, and then, of course, to the power of one over p, and then to construct the LP space of, of the von Neumann algebra, we have to consider the closure with respect to this P norm of the von Neumann algebra e of gamma, R of gamma. And for P equal to infinity, we just consider the L infinity to be the von Neumann algebra with the operator norm. And for every F in LP, we can um, define its Fourier coefficients that for uh, uh, an element gamma in, in the group, uh, the, Fourier, the gamma Fourier coefficients of, of Fourier coefficient of, of F is the trace of F 
time uh, composed with the right, uh, the, I mean, with this unitary operator divided by the right regular representation of the group. And we have these two uh, typical results in, in Fourier analysis. The first one is the Plancherel theorem, which says that if a, 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 an operator is in L2 of the von Neumann algebra, um, its coefficients form a sequence in L2 of gamma. And the norm of the operator in L2 of the von Neumann algebra coincides with the norm in little L2 of gamma of, the, of its Fourier coefficients. And the other one says that the Fourier coefficients uniquely determine um, operators in L1, because if one has uh, an operator in L1 uh, with Fourier coefficients uh, all equal to zero, then the operator has to be zero. Okay, so uh, I, I didn't say anything about our representation, but if I want to prove something, I have to impose uh, some condition on, on the representation that I am going, I, I, am, I will work with. So we will work with what are called dual integrable representations. And dual integrable representations are those for which there exists a sequilinear map, which is uh, defined on H cross H and takes a, a values in L1 of the von Neumann algebra. This sequilinear map is called bracket map and is defined in this way. So the, it's the unique element in L1 for which its Fourier coefficients here are given by this sequence, okay? So I have two functions in H. So the element that this bracket map assigns to, to these two elements is the operator in L1 whose Fourier coefficients are given by uh, the inner product on H of one element and pi uh, gamma applied to the other element. So they are determined by its Fourier coefficients, of course. And Davide uh, with uh, Eugenio and with Javier Parcet proved that a representation is dual integrable if and only if it is a square integrable in the sense that there exists a dense subset of, of D of H such that the, this sequence for any psi in the dense set and any phi on H belongs to L2 of gamma. So let me give you some examples of this bracket map. So the translations that we saw at the beginning um, form a dual integrable representation and the bracket map is given uh, here uh, is the sum over the integers by the product of the periodizations of the Fourier transform of each of the functions. The Benedetto's translations have a bracket map which is defined in a similar way. Yes, and here we are summing up on C, where C is essentially the quotient between the dual group and the annihilator of our group, uh, our subgroup A, subgroup H, which turn, turns out to be uh, discrete, of course. And the last example that I want to give you is the left regular representation, which is defined in a similar way than the right, but on, I mean, in the opposite direction. It's also a, a representation of our group gamma into the unitary operators of the sequences. And is defined here, or another way to understand it is this one, okay? And for this regular representation, the bracket map uh, between F and G is given by the composition of the Fourier transform of uh, one sequence and the adjoint of the Fourier transform of the other sequence where 
of course, this is the definition of the Fourier transform of a function here, and it is in terms of the right regular representation. Okay, so <clears throat> now why I, I, I emphasize these uh, left regular representations? Because they play an important role in what follows. So let me... Um, say something about the spaces that are invariant by the left uh, regular representation in L2. Um, so we, we prove uh, for this particular representation with Davide and Eugenio also, that a closed subspace of L2 of gamma is invariant under the left regular representation if and only if there exists a projection belonging to the, to the von Neumann algebra, such that the Fourier transform of this space is Q times L2. And in that case, this projection um, is exactly the projection onto the space, okay? And this result is um, an extension of a very known result due to Helson and also attributed to uh, Srinivasan and Wiener. And this result says that a closed subspace of L2 of the torus is invariant and the multiplication by C to the K, where K is an integer and C is, is a, a variable here in the torus, if and only if M is equal to the characteristic function of E times L2 for a measurable, uh, some measurable set E, okay? So the, the, these are the same result because this is a projection. This is the, exactly the projection that we put here, okay? And we prove even more. Uh, we prove that every left invariant space B in L2 is principal in the sense that it is generated by the left regular representation for a single sequence. Any, any left invariant space is generated by a, a single sing, uh, by a single sequence. And moreover, B given by the Fourier transform of the projection of, of B uh, generate, I mean, it's a Percival uh, frame generator. So, for this sequence P, these systems, this system is a Percival frame for B. And this is the key point uh, to prove what we, what we want, okay? So I am very lost with the time. So please let me know when I'm done. You have more so, four minutes, Victoria. Four minutes? Yeah. Perfect. So um, then let, P be a dual integrable unitary representation uh, of gamma on H and consider um, a single element on H and the space generated with our representation for it, uh, by it. And recall that we wanted to prove that we have a frame generator of, of the principal, of this principal space. And what we prove for, for, for obtaining the result is the following. We prove that given any function, any element on, of H, if we take the sequence given by the Fourier transform of the projection onto the orthogonal complement of the kernel of the bracket between phi and itself, then there is an isometric isomorphism between the space generated by phi uh, and the space generated in L2 of gamma uh, by P and this uh, S uh, isometric isomorphism satisfies this condition here. And as a consequence, since this P was a Percival frame generator, if we uh, go back with S to the H side and we take this element on H, uh, this element will generate a Parseval frame of, of the principal uh, invariant space 
that we started with. So then uh, I don't want to say anything about the, the proof of that result, but only that is, it requires much, much, much more effort than the, the, the composition into the orthogonal uh, principal shift invariant spaces. But I want to say that the construction involves this um, bracket between the generator uh, and itself to the power of one half. And this is reminiscent with the Euclidean case where the frame generator was, ta was taken to be of this form, where because this, the, the, this element that we have here is exactly the bracket map for the, for the case of the translations. And then, uh, well, combining these two results, the orthogonal decomposition and the existence of frame generators on principal invariant spaces, we can prove that any P invariant subspace uh, for a P a dual integrable representation um, has a parseval frame of orbits. And well, I think that I, I'm skip. Uh, well, of course, that uh, this is the way how we do it. We first decompose the space into principal uh, invariant spaces, and then we take uh, in any of the principal uh, invariant spaces a frame generator. And if we collect these phi j's, then we will get a parseval frame uh, of orbits of the whole space. So I think that I will skip what follows because uh, it's going to be too much. And thank you very much for your attention. So let's thank Victoria. So any questions or comments? We have time for may, one or two questions. May I ask a question, please? Yes. Hi, Vicky. How are you? Hi, Asita. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Very nice talk. Thank you. Um, I feel I have two questions, but my first question is about clarification. Could you please go page 11 about the result, Helson's result that you mentioned? Page 11. Yes. Oh, yeah. So uh, just for the clarification, what is that? Is that the chi E L2? What do you mean by that? This? You mean? Ah, it's the characteristic function. This, you can understand this as L2 of E. Are the functions in L2 with vanish, vanish, uh, vanishing outside E? Oh, but I, I put it in the similar way that I stated here, just to confuse you. <laughs> okay, that means that if uh, M is invariant under the multiplication by the powers or the polynomials, right? Yes. So that means that the M is the of this form of the all the in the form of the characteristic function for one specific set E or yes. all the characteristic functions. No, no, just for one. I mean, you can prove that given a, an M that it's invariant under these multiplications, you can find a measurable set E such that M is L2 of E, whereby oh, L2 of I E see. can mean okay. that there are all the L2 functions supported. Supported, okay. E. Got it, thank you. My, my second question goes to, back to your result in page 13, I guess, with uh, David and Eugenio. Um, oh. Yeah, this one. Is that the isomorphism, is that constructible or? The, yes, it's contractible. So what about the inverse? How easy is it to construct the, or say the inverse? Is that also? I mean, uh, do we know the exact form of the inverse? Sorry? Do we know the exact form of the inverse function here? No. In, well, I mean, later, I mean. Uh, no, because there are some Fourier coefficients that we take and we consider the, Yes, no, I mean, it's not explicit, but not explicit in the general case, but in the particular case, of course, it is. Yeah, basically, because uh, if we know how to uh, 
at least yes, that, explicitly um, it's there. So you have a kind of like a big class of the all the generators for the parse world frame, I, I believe. Yes, but it is enough to, to take one. And the problem that is um, until this result, we, we didn't know that you can do this for any uh, Hilbert space and any dual representation. But I mean, morally, is we you have to, as in the usual case, to multiply by this element to the power of minus one half and take the Fourier coefficients and then construct something. And this is a function that you, you will get uh, to generate a parsable frame. But I mean, I, I didn't say too much about this. Um, is uh, isomorphism because it's, I mean, almost the, the whole paper. It's, it's not that easy to construct. It's not that easy because of the non commutative setting, of course. That's right. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so since you are short in time, uh, let us thank Victoria again. Oh. So, I Lucas, stop recording. Uh, yes. just, just a second. Um, we are a little bit late with the schedule. So, um, our last speaker is uh, Jill Fighter. Yes. Uh, cannot uh, be late than three. So, I was wondering if it's possible to interchange the, one of the two next speakers with her. Uh, so, we will ask uh, Michael or this, Hello, is, this, is, this is Michael. I'm happy to, I can give this talk now. Sorry? This is Michael Lacey. I can speak now if you need, if you need to. Okay, so you're willing to talk after Jill? No, the question is different, Michael. Uh, we are asking if Jill can talk now instead of you. Oh, sure, no problem. Oh. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank Perfect. you very much, Michael. So, so, so our next speaker is Jill. Five, seven, nine.